Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time and this week's topic guys is what's in a candlestick? What's inside of a candlestick and why is that important to know? Why do we want to know how a candlestick forms, right? So if you have a five minute candlestick, red or green, it doesn't matter, and you drill down to a two minute chart or a one minute chart, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to know how that bar formed? Well, today we're going to talk about that very topic. And I'm telling you straight up, it's extremely important to know how a bar forms, not just where a bar forms, that's also important, but how a bar forms. It will help you with your bar by bar management. It will help you get better entries. It will also help you keep you out of bad trades as well. So there's many, many things here um, that understanding what's inside a candlestick can do for you, help make your trading better, help make it more reliable, which makes you more profitable, okay? So it's a little bit more granular today. We're gonna go really deep into the technicals today, but I'm telling you, this can help supercharge your profits, so don't overlook this topic. Many people don't realize what's in a bar. They'll just look at a bar and I'll say to them, hey, what does that look like on the one minute? And they'll go, I don't know. Why don't you know? You should be able to visualize what every bar looks like on a higher or lower time frame, depending on if it's a topping tail, a bottoming tail, a doji bar, a wide range bar, et cetera. So today you're gonna learn a little bit more about how to do that so you can be a better trader. If you like these videos, please click that like button, smash hammer that subscribe button. I am Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic is, what's in a candlestick, right? Somebody said it sounds poetic. I don't know about that, but uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit what's inside a candlestick. And the reason is, is we're going to piggyback last week's lecture. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not. Maybe some of you have, some of you haven't, but I try to tie things together. I try not to jump all over the place and just do random stuff. So when I do a topic, I try to spend two or three lectures on a similar related topic to, to drive uh, the information home. Because I understand that you know, from my perspective, it seems like, well, that's obvious, but it's not, you know what I mean? And anytime we learn something new, we recognize it takes a while to learn it. But when you know something to where it's unconscious competence, you take for granted the little things that other people don't know. So that's one of the reasons I try to do two to three weeks on similar topics before kind of moving on to something different. Uh, so this week's topic, like I said, will in some ways piggyback um, last week where we did talk a little bit about candlesticks, et cetera, and so forth, and how bar by bars form. Now we're gonna go just a little bit deeper into that um, today. But before we do that, we first have to talk about when will the insanity stop? Oh, wait, we're gonna discuss that later. Um, there is one in here, but it's something that we're gonna discuss a little bit later. As it says, we'll discuss later. Um, so I have it in a different area because I think it's more appropriately used in a different area today. Um, so let's just dig in, right? Let's just dig in. Um, so this is somewhat related to what we're going to talk about. It's a little off topic, but it's a little, it's, it's on topic as well. So how the market works. And I, I think this is a very important general comment, right? So when we talk about technical analysis, we talk about using past price action to help predict future price movement, right? Okay. That's obvious. For those of you who have taken professional trading strategies, um, we have our market cycle in there, right? Our four stages of the market where you kind of have that ambivalence, indecision, uh, and ambivalence in that stage one, and then greed in stage two, and then stage three is that tug of war, indecision area, and then stage four is fear, right? Those are the cycles of the market. But the thing you have to understand is that we're not trading stocks. I know you think you are, and I know I'm not gonna really get that through your heads. We are trading people. Stocks only move because of human emotion, right? Why does a stock stop at the $100 mark sometimes? It's just a random number. It doesn't stop at 101.27, it stops at 100.0 because we're human beings, we are weird. Just admit it, we're strange beings. We do weird, weird stuff. We all have some level of superstition, 
right? We put our, our shoes on the same way every day. Why? We just do it to have it. And these are things that are very challenging for people. So the point I'm getting at is understanding that we trade people and not stocks will help you better understand the markets, okay? How do we do that? How are we understanding people and the markets better? We're doing this with bars, red and green candlesticks. So why do markets fall? Why do markets bounce? Well, this happens, guys, when the market reaches a significant support level on the way down. So this is falling, right? And then we'll talk a little about bouncing. So when a market reaches an area of support, well, why is that area support? Because it's an area that was previously uh, traded into and bounced, right? prior price or past price action to predict future price movements. So the expectation is when we reach that level again, the same thing will happen. Does it guarantee the same thing's going to happen? No, absolutely not. But this is what we talk about when we talk about pivots and retests, and we talked about that a month or two ago in our lecture. All right, so don't worry. We're going to talk more granular about this. But when you look at a significant level of support on the way down, what happens? As we come into those levels, the shorts start to become skeptical, like, ooh, well, this is an area where the market bounced in the past. So when they become skeptical, not only do they stop adding to their short positions, because if there's a free fall and there's nothing below you, you're going to continue to add to your short position or keep you know, taking new short positions because there's no reason not to. There's nothing in the past that says this is an area where we could or might expect buyers to step up. There's none of that. So why would you expect buyers to step up? You wouldn't. Therefore, you would add to your shorts and keep watching the stock or the market go lower. But when we come into an area of significant support, that changes. Remember, the mentality, the emotion changes. So you start to get skeptical like, ooh, we're coming into an area where previously buyers stepped up. Guys, we do this every day with trades. Hey, be careful, there's a pivot to the left on the 15 minute chart, right? Somebody asked about Apple today. And I said, watch, be careful. If you look at Apple over the last two days, there's a pivot to the left. So when you reach that area, the buyers become skeptical, right? Well, in this case, when the market goes lower, the sellers, the shorts are becoming skeptical, right? So you're sitting here, shorts are like, nope, we're probably not gonna go much lower, so I'm gonna stop adding to my position. And then they take it one step further. They stop adding and start covering, right? That's buying the stock. So they become skeptical first, they stop adding to their short second, and then they start to actually cover their short position. And then what happens? One more thing happens. Long slow down their selling, right? Long start going, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. We're coming into an area where the market bounced last time. So I'm going to stop my selling because I think I can get a better price later. Think about what I'm saying here. So let's just say you're trying to exit a position. Or maybe you no longer want to be in that position. But say the $100 area is where people bought it up last time. It bounced from 100 back to 120. Well, if you've been selling positions because the stock's going lower, now you're coming to the $100 and you go, ooh, the floor might be in here. They no longer want to exit their positions or certainly not as badly as they wanted to on the way down. So now they're going, well, I still want to sell, but I just don't want to sell at 100 anymore because I think I can get 105. I think I can get 107. I think I can get 110. So selling pressure decreases, right? Because the longs are no longer selling and the shorts are starting to buy. So longs aren't selling, shorts are buying cash money sitting on the sidelines waiting for their moment, they start to come back into the market, right? Remember, I don't know, three months ago, I said to you guys, I drew the levels on the SPY and the Qs. I drew four levels for you. And I said, at each one of these levels, I'm going to buy some. That's my cash money on the sidelines waiting for that level to be triggered, waiting for that level to be reached. So not only does current money, which are shorts, do they start to buy, long stop selling and new money also comes into the market. This is how bottoms are formed. Okay. During the fall, the market was largely driven by supply, more sellers than buyers, right? 
but the supply eventually gets eaten up by demand and buyers become more interested. Not just buyers or longs over here in terms of they're not selling anymore. New money comes in, cash money sitting on the sidelines and waiting. And this is the problem, just side note, side note, for this is why the average person's broke because the average person is fearful when they should be greedy and they're greedy when they should be fearful. So they don't have any new money when the market crashes because they're all in. And even if they do have some money, they're so wounded from the market pullback, psychologically wounded from the pullback, that they're never going to get back in. 2008, 2009 was a wonderful example of this. I wish you guys would go back and take a look at some tweets and take a look at a whole bunch of other stuff from back then. F Wall Street, F the markets. I'll never buy another stock again. I made this comment to you guys in the past, but I actually had a friend who literally had a million dollars that I will never put it back in the market. Sold all of his portfolio and never put it back in the market. Well, how'd that work out 15 years later when the market's up 400%? Kind of stupid, right? Kind of stupid. But that's the way people think. So note, I connected it all back to psychology. It's all about emotions, okay? So this doesn't mean necessarily that it works this way every single time. It just works this way most of the time, right? So we always look for additional confirmation, which is what we're going to talk about in a second. Volume, wide range, ending bars. That's what a W rev is, wide range, ending bars. Volume, weighted average price, VWAP, moving average. We're always looking for these extra forms and levels of confirmation when we come into these significant support levels, okay? Waiting for confirmation costs a little bit, but it also increases your odds. What I mean by cost a little bit, it means you're not going to be the first person in the stock. That's what I mean when I say it costs a little bit. You're not going to be the first person at the very, very bottom, at the bottom of the bottoming tail. But that's okay. I don't want to be. Why? Because I'd rather take a more secure entry slightly later to increase my odds. Because I don't think the earlier fill justifies the higher risk, in my opinion. Okay, so this is why markets fall and why they bounce if you flip it. And the reason I spent so much time going through this slide is I need you, I want you, I need you to understand the psychology behind why markets do what they do. Because this is the broader base comment. This is the entire market, the entire chart. Now we're going to take the chart and take it into bars. Okay, and we're going to look inside them. So last week you guys saw this, right? We went over this exact slide last week. The beginning of it on the left is simple. I'm just not going to spend much time on this. This is a buy setup. When you break above this green bar, you're triggered in, which is number two right here, right? When you break above this green bar, you're in it. Then it starts to move higher, right? And then over here, a green bar that opens 50 set, right? So I'm not even going to do it. Rehash last week's lecture and re-listen to it, all right? But now we're going to look at each one of these bars inside the bar. Right Before we were just talking about the bar. Oh, it's green. Oh, it's red. What does that mean? That's great. But now we're going to look inside the bar. Okay, so I talk about this frequently. And this is when you get to a level of unconscious competence. When you can look at a bar and know how it formed or at least have a good idea of how it probably formed. Now, obviously, drilling down to a lower time frame will let you know for sure how it formed. Okay, so if you're on a five minute chart and you drill down to a two minute or a one minute, you're getting more granular. You're looking inside this to get a better picture of how it formed. Now, why would that possibly be important to you? Because it's going to give you an indication of what's likely going to happen next. You know how some people will use indicators, they'll use the Com Channel Index, or they'll use an RSI indicator, or Bollinger Bands, and then they'll go, oh, it's a moving average crossover, double axe, triple, I don't care, right? I'm serious, people do these things, and they're like, well, when there's a divergence in the CCI, and then the RSI hits this level, and the Bollinger Band slaps me in the ass, oh my gosh, it's a guaranteed buy signal. Well, maybe there's truth in that, maybe. But every one of those things that we just talked about is based on these bars. So why not start with the bar? Duh, start with the actual bar that's forming that helps the indicator form because the indicator lags the bar. 
So my point I'm getting at simply is this. Let's go to the middle of here. We have this big wide range green bar, right? Starts at the bottom, ends at the top. Now, this bar could form in a lot of different ways, right? Here are three possible ways this bar could form on a one minute. One green bar, two green bars, three green bars, four green bars, five. It could literally just be five green bars going straight up. That's how this wide range five minute bar may have formed. Now, why might that be important to me? Well, it may be important to me because if the next green bar that follows this green bar does the same thing, now I am 10 bars in a row up on a one minute chart. Now you may look at the five and go, well, we're only up two bars, Jared. And I'll say, you're right, but we're up 10 one minute bars. That's a problem for me. Do you see where I'm going with this? So while you may only be up one or two or three bars on a five minute chart, when you drill down to the two or the one and get granular and get inside, right? Now you have a better understanding of what's more likely to happen because the one minute and two minute are, are foreshadowing what's probably going to happen on the five minute. This will help you tremendously what is going to happen next now i have a better understanding now we go to the this one right one minute chart here wide range green bar with a small topping tail well, that that topping tail then turns into a little bit of a red bar that little tiny red bar gets engulfed by the green bar followed by a narrow range red bar followed by a narrow range green bar okay what's the difference here this ripped up on the one minute, and, and it's a super big one minute, but the next four minutes, the stock went sideways. So in this scenario, right, the second example here, this scenario right under this middle one minute chart here, if a wide range green bar comes in on the five minute, I feel more confident that there has been a long enough period of rest that the five minute will continue higher. Whereas on the first example, I'm up five bars in a row. So the next bar that forms on the five minute, I'm starting to become more and more skeptical that it's going to be able to hold this level of strength because it hasn't rested in a long time. Okay. Now, if we go to the third and final example right here on the far right side, it opens up small green, then goes small red, then goes small green, then goes small red. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But then rip, wide range, one minute green bar. There's nothing wrong with this. But it's also a super wide range, one minute bar. And it rested before it broke, not after. So when you look at these three scenarios, I'd rather have scenario number two. Right. The first scenario is straight up. The second scenario is straight up with a four minute rest. And the third scenario is a four minute rest with one wide range bar. I'd rather have scenario number two because it's the most likely to be able to sustain the move higher if we see another bar. And this is why it's important to know how a bar forms. And guys, this is only three examples. There's a, almost an infinite number of ways that this five minute green bar can form, almost infinite. But there are certain ways that are better than others, okay? Over here on the left, we start on the left hand side now with this big bottoming tail bar, right? So what do we have? A green bar, big bottoming tail, but it's a narrow body bar but a wide range bar. So there are multiple ways this could form. It could literally open up and go red bar, red bar, red bar, red bar, wide range green bar. Now, while this is an extremely potent green bar, right? It took out four red bars, super potent. It makes it more challenging to justify a move higher. I'm not saying that it's not gonna go higher. It's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying now that you put in this super wide range green bar, it becomes more challenging to justify a second or third green bar. Whereas I look at example number two, right? We start off with a little green bar. So the stock actually moved higher initially. Then sellers came in took about 50%, well, actually like 150% out of this, and they continued lower. And then the next move was two bars back up. The point I'm getting at is 
if you dig deep inside how these bars form, it's going to give you a better understanding of what's realistically possible next. Because if you're already up five bars and then another wide range bar forms and you're up another five bars and all of a sudden you're up 10 green bars, it may only look like two fives, but it's 10 ones. Got it? And this is another reason, even though it's not the point of today's topic, this is another reason that I'm such a stickler for pre-market charts. And I tell you guys this all the time, like, guys, I really like this stop, but it just put in five green five-minute bars right before the market opened. Well, the, more than likely, it's going to have one green bar off the open and pull right back, wait for the pullback. If it has one or two green bars right before the market opens, it makes it a much more viable one minute three bar play entry. Guys, I hope this is making sense because I'm telling you, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you it's profound. So you want to know how I justify whether or not I should take that two minute three bar play or that one minute high. It's not just based off the gap. Of course it is. Of course it's based off the gap. But the actual entry, right, the gap is my bias. But the actual entry is based off of what I am seeing on this, the lower time frames, the one and the two minute versus the five, as well as what I see in the pre-market. How it enters the morning, the 9.30 market open bell is very important to me. Because if it's already up for the last 20 minutes in the pre-market, usually they're just going to peekaboo, go pop a quick dollar and then pull right back. Well, I don't want to take a one minute high on that, it's extended. I don't want to take a one minute three bar play on that. It's extended. So digging deeper inside this, using pre-market, getting as much data and information as you possibly can is also going to increase your confirmation, which increases your odds, right? So then we go back to this, which is similar to what you just saw. So now we're not just seeing five minute bars here, okay? We can now say, oh, did this buy, I'm on the top right, I'm on the top right, okay, for those of you who can't see my cursor. So now we're looking at the top right, I'm going, well, did this buy setup on the five minute, did it trigger up five bars? And then the second bar came in, it's up another five bars on the one minute. So imagine what you're looking at as a five minute chart. But then imagine this little green bar is five one minute bars. Then imagine this second in this case third green bar or second green bar is up another five minute five one minute bars now you're up 10 one minute bars so this red bar coming back is not that shocking why is this important it's important because while a red bar that opens near the prior bars close and closes less than 50 is a neutral to bearish bar that is a true statement but if it happened after 10 one minute bars up I'm going to be a little more patient with it because it was extended. It showed great strength, but it was also extended on the one minute. So it may not be as bearish as it potentially looks because I drilled down inside the green bars and saw what was happening. Make sense? It's kind of like, I'm trying to think of an analogy off the top of my head on the fly here. It's kind of like somebody who ran a marathon yesterday and now a scout, a college scout comes out to watch them run today. And the college scout doesn't know they ran a marathon yesterday. So this runner is out there practicing today and they look a little sluggish today. And the scout's like, yeah, they don't look like a very good runner. But then the coach comes up and says, yeah, no, you're right. But they ran a marathon yesterday and they won the marathon. They won yesterday's marathon. So obviously they're a little tired today. But if you didn't know they had won yesterday's marathon and all you saw them was sluggish runner today, you'd be like, yeah, no, that's not a very good runner. Do you see what I'm going with? Context matters. It matters very much. And this is why it's important to drill down and know what's happening inside each bar. Okay, and when you do, you get a better understanding or a higher level of confirmation. Okay, so let's take a look. All right. Bar by bar analysis, different time frames. So when we look at SQ, this is a trade that we took yesterday. Okay. So right here you see a bottoming tail. Okay. So the first thing you're thinking on this bottoming tail, right? If you see this little green arrow left hand side of the chart, bottoming tail, you're thinking to yourself, well, on a one minute, that's gotta be some green bars. 
Possibly. Oh, well, let's take a look. Oh my gosh, it's a one minute sell setup, right? That's the first thing you need to be thinking. When you see this one, this bottoming tail on the five on the left, you go over to the right hand side. The right hand side's the one minute chart. I don't know why it says two minutes. Let's just change that and make sure it's correct. All right, so we went from a five minute to a one minute. We're looking at the green arrow and the green arrow. Look on the right hand side. What do we have? A little bit of a sell setup. Right? Is it a great sell setup? Not really, but it's still a sell setup. That sell setup is what this bottoming tail is. You need to be thinking that when you see the bottoming tail in the five, you need to be thinking, you know, I, did, I better check the one minute because there might be a sell setup right there. So then we dr go down lower, wide range red bar, bottoming tail, and this pink, the first pink arrow on the left, bottoming tail, bounce back up, red engulfing bar, green engulfing bar. The first thing you're thinking right here, one, I don't like this green engulfing bar if I'm short, and that's what happened to us yesterday. I don't like the green engulfing bar if I'm short. But the second thing I'm thinking of is double bottom retest. On a one minute chart, this looks like a double bottom retest. Well, let's go over. Let's follow the, the pink line all the way over. Okay, there's the first pink arrow bounce. Second pink arrow, yes, it's a lower low. You're correct, it's a lower low, but it's not a significant new low, okay? And one other thing I wanna do here, guys, I, I should have done this yesterday, but let me do it now. Let's do it in real time, okay? Let's put this up here. Let's do this with it. If we draw a trend line, right? My goodness, what happens here? So that's a trend line I just put on the chart, okay? So now we see a double bottom retest. Yes, I know it's a slightly lower low, I get it bounced back up did a 100% retracement to the prior pivot high. Prior pivot high, 100% retracement. In doing so, it broke above the trend line. Everything points to higher prices right here, everything, okay? The stock was weak, that's great. It tried to put in a new low, and that new low left a bottoming tail. That retracement right here on the first arrow, the first arrow on the one minute chart, that retracement, is about 80% back to 64.50. Then it retests the low, puts in a slightly lower low, and then goes right back to 64.40. If you guys recall, and I hope that you do, I said to you guys specifically, guys, if SQ breaks 64.50, it's over, we're done. They were my exact words. If SQ breaks above 64.50, it's over, we're done. Well, we trailed out at break even. Right, we trailed out at break even. We were in at $65, and then we broke above 64.50, which is above the trend line, which is above this resistance pivot area. We put in a higher low, another little bottoming tail, right? So I'm at the end of the trend line here on the right hand side at $64. We put in a higher low. Four bars later, there's a bottoming tail at 64, and we bounced. We broke above 64.50. Guess what happens now? What was 64.50? 64.50 was the ceiling, right? We couldn't get over it, right? There's a pivot here at, at 10.05. There's another pivot at, at 10.12. There's another pivot at 10.25, another pivot at 10.30. This resistance area at 64.50, once broken at 10.40-ish, becomes the floor. The ceiling became the floor. So now we're inside the blue box. And now 64.50 is the floor. And the stock went back up. Guys, this is how you're reading inside these bars, bar by bar, five minute chart to one minute chart. You're getting a better understanding of what's likely going to happen next because of the being granular and looking not just inside the bar, but looking at the overall picture as well as looking inside the bar, five minute to one minute. And this is why I tell you guys, always put all time frames up. Put your five minute, two minute, one minute, 15 minute up at all times. The daily I have up all the time as well, but you should have checked the daily first before they even got to this stage, okay? So now we'll move to another one because I'll run out of time if not, all right? The cues on the weekly, hmm. So now we're grinding up. We had that crazy little COVID drop in the market back in March 2020, and then April came and whoof, 
It's like nothing ever happened in the market. And we ripped. I mean, we went from like 170 all the way up to 400. Okay. We moved higher. We pulled back. Now, October of 21, right where this green line is, we did a little bit of a miniature retest in October 2021. And we bounced. We put in a new high. And then we did what? We went for a bit of a tug of war right in the $400 area from October to December of 2021. We just chop, chop, red bar, green bar, red bar, green bar, topping tail, red bar. Guys, where is that support area? It's right there, right? The support area, let's put a line on it, okay? Again, these are areas and there is already a red line there, but let's put that there, okay? That was, so let's make it green, right? That was a support area. That's not the right green, Jerry. There we go. All right. That was a support area. Then it broke. And now we have the next support area. It chops up, pulls back, chops up. And now that red line becomes resistance. So this green line that was support has now turned into this red line, which is resistance. And also note, you draw the trend line. And we head right back to the trend line. We dropped and broke. So now again, this area from January, February of 2022, right around the 325 mark, right next to this resistance icon, that was an area the market bounced. It should have been some form, some level of support. We broke right through it. So now that we broke through that area of support, it becomes resistance on the way back up. Then we broke through that resistance area here recently, but we held the trend line. Uh-oh. What are we looking at here? If you're looking at the weekly chart of the Qs, there's only one thing you can say. We have transitioned past tense from a stage two, a very bullish stage two uptrend that lasted about 18 months, right? It was a stage two bullish uptrend that lasted about 18 months, okay? And now we dropped, we popped, we dropped, we popped, and now we're dropping again. We clearly went from a stage three V top into a stage four downtrend. Now, the only area that matters is 270. It's the only area that matters on the floor. Because guys, and let me draw another one here. If this area right here, okay, and Ren, there are areas. If this area is breached, <laughs> market's in deep shit, all right? If you get below 270, if you get below this pivot from June, if you get below this pivot from October 2021, or sorry, 2020, this, this big line I drew, the markets are in big, 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 big trouble. That is where I think we're headed in the next six to 12 months. Because I say we're in big, 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 big trouble with so many bigs because there's a lot of room to fall. And the markets are doing their darndest to push into that area. Is it possible we put in a higher low and bounce? Sure, it's possible. Right? It's very possible. I just don't think that's going to happen. But right now, generally speaking, you need to stay a little bit bearish. Okay? Exactly right, Elias. We could make a higher low. I just said that. It's very possible. Okay? But with this much selling pressure, I think we'll go lower. All right. Now, we just looked at the weekly chart of the Qs. We just looked at the weekly chart of the Qs. Now, and I'm not going to spend as much time on this. I want to move on to the next slide. Now we're at the daily chart of the Qs, okay? I put this red, sorry, pink arrow here so you know that's the peak, okay? That's the correlation. So that red arrow here at 405 or whatever it is is this pink arrow, Jared. This pink arrow here at 405 is the same one that's pointing to here. But you can see, now we get a little more granular. We're in our stage two uptrend. We put in a little double top retest. You almost have like a miniature head and shoulders right here right? If you look at the Q's daily, a little kind of head and shoulders, we break below 380, drop. Lower high, we bounce back up into resistance, drop, pop, drop. We get an equal low here in March at 320. We bounce, we drop. Bounce, we drop. And then the markets tried very, very hard to bounce. And then they gave it up. The markets should have held this 305 area. They didn't. 292. Today they're at 296, right? 
we have room to 280, easy room. When we hit 280, now we start getting into much more support. And then I told you that, that 260 to 280, I said 270, call it 260 to 280, is a very, very important spot for the markets. And in the next coming weeks or months, and like I said, we may bounce up before we go lower. We had a really nasty start to the year, right? We were down 20 to 30%, depending on the industry, in the first six months. It's normal for the market to bounce a little bit. You're down 20 or 30%. It doesn't change the bigger picture bias though, okay? So now let's take a look at this. Let's review this chart. I've taken everything off this chart, okay? There's no pricing, there's no dates, there's no time frame. I want you guys to, to go through this with me. What is the next likely direction and area this will move into? Well, let's talk about it. Over here on the left, we have a little bit of a stage one, right? Where this red line is on the left, stage one, okay? Then we start to break out transition plus early stage two, right? So where the arrow is, is actually just the transition period, right? We're not actually in a stage two at this arrow, but we're transitioning. We're getting closer to becoming into a stage two. We rip, pull back, rip, pull back significantly. That's a significant pullback. These two huge red bars are significant. Why? They broke below support right here. Then it pulls back to the secondary support area, right? Because if we're, if we're being honest, and we put a little line there, this right here was kind of that first area of support, right? Where this small red line is, with, there's a pivot right there, there's a pivot right here. It's an area of support, okay? Broke below it and held the secondary area of support. Ripped all the way back up to a 100% retracement and then failed. Shallow bounce failed. This was a significant area of support, this, this big red line here. Drop down, consolidated, now what? So guys, in your opinion, in your opinion, what's the next likely move for this stock? Higher, lower, neutral? If you're just reading the chart, just, just let the chart speak to you. What's the next likely move for this? Where do you think we go? Higher? Lower? Stay about the same? What does it look like to you guys? So Ilias thinks this looks like a neutral chart. Okay. The next likely move is lower. The only answer here is lower. There's no other answer to this but lower. That's it. You are in a stage four downtrend. You did a little kind of inverse head and shoulders here. You failed every every way you possibly could fail right what are you doing right here you're retesting this area sure you're a little bit extended but you're testing an area of support that was already broken every area of support's been broken on this it has not proven even one time that there's any strength in this stock from this double top see the second top right there to where we are right now today there has not been an inkling of strength in this stock period end of discussion zero where's the strength been this little sideways choppy price action with a topping tail that's not strength because it got completely taken out. This bottoming tail, which was at support at the time, was supposed to bounce. This bottoming tail above the 200 MA at support was supposed to bounce. What happened? It left two topping tails and it had a gap down with a wide range red bar. Where are you guys seeing neutral? Where are you seeing strength in this chart? Are you, are you looking at it upside down? Lower, until otherwise stated differently. What would make me feel possibly their strength here? Well, if it broke this pivot, if it broke that pivot, right? If it broke that pivot, then maybe I could say, well, there's a little bit of strength. But until it does that, there's only one way to look at this chart and it's called weak because it hasn't broken any prior pivot highs. It keeps retesting, it keeps retracing 100% into prior pivot lows. There's no strength here. Next area is this green line right here, this big green line. Why? Because that's when it initially broke out of stage one, right? So exactly right, Mario. Show me the strength first. I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt until you show me something. I'm not just going to trust you can do it. Show me you can do it, and then maybe I'll trust you. Oh, just trust me, sir. Just trust. No, I don't know anything about you. 
I have no emotional attachment to you. I'm just, I'm looking at your past price action and your past price action suggests you are very weak, right? And why did I bring this chart up? And why did I take all of the information off of it? Well, that's easy. Because I'm trying to take your emotions out. I'm trying to take the cult-like status that is Bitcoin and get you guys to look at a chart realistically. I don't give a shit about Bitcoin. I don't have any money invested in it, which means I don't like it, nor do I hate it. I don't even have a neutral opinion about it. I took everything off this chart because I wanted you guys to look at the chart for what it really is, weak. It may bounce and prove me wrong. It may bounce to 70,000. But right now, right here today, this is a weak chart that looks lower. It looks like it's got room to about 12,000, right? I'm just looking at the chart. I have no emotions attached to this chart. My kid's college fund money isn't in this chart. I don't care what it does. It looks lower down to 12,000, okay? And this is why, this is where you go, Ilias. You're putting your emotions here. That's why I said neutral, it's not going lower. How do you know it's not? What did it do yesterday? It lost $650 in one bar yesterday. So wait, I'm gonna take a picture of that. We're gonna come back and discuss this six to 12 months from now. So you're saying it's not going lower. Well, can I have the same crystal ball that you have? Because I bet you, you didn't think it was gonna go from 70,000 to 18.8 either, did you? That's my guess, okay? The Bitcoin, you know, the, the Bitcoin cult, right? Probably didn't think it was going from 70 to 18. So the point here, guys, is this, and this goes for everything. You read the chart, take the name off the chart, erase the name on the chart, and you just read the chart. It makes your life easier, much simpler, that's for sure. And you go bar by bar, and you look at the support and resistance areas on the chart Okay, and you ask yourself, what's the next likely direction? We are not Nostradamus, we're not perfect. We're not going to be right every time, but the chart will give you a, a pretty strong indication of the next likely direction. But we have stop losses for a reason because we're not always right. Okay, <laughs> I remember that one, Mary. It's a hedge against inflation. I love that one, that was funny, okay? So the chart suggests 10 to 12,000 is the next stop before you should find actual support. Could it find support at 15,000? Sure, it's a random spot, but it could. The chart suggests that 12,000 area is the rough area where buyers should step in. Why? Because it's where they stepped in before. Why didn't it bounce at 40,000 and go back to 70? It's weak, that's why. Why didn't it bounce at 30,000? It's weak, that's why. Why should it stop at 18,000? It didn't stop at 40. It didn't stop at 30. Why should it stop at 18? What's the reasoning? Because guaranteed people out there said the same crap at 30,000. It should stop right here, it's gonna bounce. They said it at 40, it should stop right here, it's gonna bounce. Why should it stop at 18? It shouldn't. There's no real reason for it. It may, it may not, but there's no reason for it, okay? All right, so now, when will the insanity stop? Read the chart, not your emotions. So orange equals the old trend line, pink is the new trend line, okay? So this is, uh, you know, somebody commenting on RKT. I'm on the weekly chart. Somebody, I don't know who Jay is. Maybe he's the CEO. Maybe he's the CFO. I don't really know and I don't care. Somebody bought 36 million shares of this stock, okay? Somebody else bought 12,800 shares at $19.35. Ooh, how's that going for you? I don't know where RKT is today, but I'm going to guess it's still in the $7 or $8 range, okay? Look at the chart. Read the chart, okay? One, it's a sloppy garbage chart. Garbage, it's a chart that you generally wouldn't trade. But this line is where I wanna to go to, this support line right here, this green line at $15. Why in the world would you ever buy this thing anywhere below 15? If you bought it at 19, I still don't understand it, right? 
Now it breaks below 15, drops, pops, drops, pops, drops, pops, dropping. So orange, that's the old trend line. Why do I say old? Because every time or any time we form a new pivot, we draw a new trend line. Now this pivot is mostly formed, so I drew a new trend line, okay? So this stock broke above the old trend line, but look at it now. It's retesting the prior pivot low. Read the chart, not your emotions. The chart suggests lower prices here. And if it does bounce, now it has to get above the pink line, number one. Then it has to get above 15, which we all know is a significant area of resistance. What was the floor becomes the ceiling. What was support becomes resistance. This is a foolish thing. This is why it's on when will the insanity stop? Buying this thing at $19, buy it at 15, right? And if it breaks 15, buy it at 15, give it a $1 stop loss. If it breaks the support area, you don't wanna be in it. So buying it at 19 is just foolish. You wanna buy it at 16, give it a stop at 14. Okay, maybe it's worth a shot. I don't think it's worth a shot, but maybe it's worth a shot. Once you break 15, it is O-V-E-R for this thing. Okay, O-V-E-R for this thing. No, the pivot's what you want to go with, right? $7.25. This person's down $12.10 on this stock. Are you kidding me? That's what? 60% haircut? 65% haircut? Something like that? Damn! This is why we use stop losses. It's why we use the chart as our guide because I don't have to get emotional about it, right? I don't need to get emotional about it. You guys saw this last week. I'll bring it up just real briefly. I'm not going to go over it in great detail. <clears throat> I'm bringing it up so you can take a picture of it. So you can, I've had a few people ask me to send them the slide deck this week. No, take a picture of it if you want to review this chart from last week, okay? Bar by bar, we went through this chart. Now, the difference between this week and last week is instead of seeing a bottoming tail and then a big red bar and a bottoming tail and a big red bar, that's what we did. We went, now I want you guys to drill down. Instead of using a five-minute chart, use a one-minute chart. What does that bottoming tail show? That bottoming tail right here means green bars on a one-minute chart, okay? That bottoming tail means green bars, then this bottoming tail means the same. So what I want you guys to look at is <clears throat> dig down, dig deeper from this five minute chart and go down to a two minute or a one minute so you can really see what's inside here. Why? Because you might find, for example, it says possible reversal. Well, if you dig down to the one minute, you might see a sell setup right there. You might see an earlier entry than this right here, possibly, okay? Yeah, you, got, you want my firstborn child too, Randy. I mean, seriously. Like, is there anything you guys don't ask for these days? Like, I'm not joking with you. Like, I wish I was kidding, but you guys ask for everything. I'm, I mean, you probably want like one of those neural links to be inside my head too. Uh, you guys get a lot of stuff, man. I would just take what you have and be grateful and thankful. These are something I started years ago because I thought people needed a little bit of extra help on weeklies. No other chat room gives weekly lectures. Not one, none give weekly lectures, okay? <laughs> Anyway, on to this one. Bar by bar analysis helps you stay in and get out. So this is bar by bar. Drill down. Guess what that bottoming tail is going to show you on a one minute? It's going to show you that this is happening before you actually see it happening on a five minute. Right? It's going to see, you're going to see this bar happening before you actually get the five minute bar finished. Why is that important? Because if your stock that you shorted turns climactic, I want to get out on the one minute, not wait for the five minute. Because if I wait for the five minute, I might not get out to like $27.20 and I give up a dollar worth of profits. Use the bar by bar. This right here, see this big topping tail? The one minute's giving you a sell setup. It's giving you a double top retest sell setup. Doesn't mean you have to take it, but it should reconfirm the weakness of the stock and also give you more confidence that your five minute breakdown is going to work. Okay. I mentioned this to you guys earlier, so that I'm just rehashing this just because, well, when you have a crappy situation, you just feel like you need it. Remember when I said earlier, you say things and people don't listen? Well, this will probably be this slide. I just wanted to show you guys in detail. This is the Netflix trade we took today. Why did I like Netflix? Two reasons. I like this little turnaround bar and it gave us kind of a three bar play here, but then this happened. 
Do you see this little green bar with a bottoming tail? As soon as I saw that, I was all in done sold, sold on this thing. So it opened with a red bar to open the day. Then it had a green bar engulf the red bar and then a red bar, kind of a narrow range red bar, not entirely, but kind of a narrow range red bar with a bottoming tail. Then another narrow range red bar with a topping tail. And then that topping tail turned into this bottoming tail. When I saw that bottoming tail and this come right back up, I was sold. I had to have it, had to have it. 220.50 was the actual entry by 219. I got filled at 220.62. You can see it right here, sorry, 220.61. There's my fill. I started my order at 220.45, filled me at 220.61, okay? I took 50 shares off, why? Because I got filled about 15, 16 cents later than I expected. So I took a small amount off to keep money management proper. Therefore, because I got filled late, my target also became bigger than 223.50, right? Our target was 223.50, but I needed more. I needed exactly 223.82. Well, it ended up being exactly the high of the day. It filled 697 of my shares up there and left me with 553 shares. Well, I only made 2,600 bucks instead of the four grand I was looking for. I put it on here because that's Murphy. The plan is always right. I did the right thing here. I can't help that it went one penny that it went to my, my target and didn't fill me. There's nothing you can do about that. You know what's pissing me off? It's back at 224 right now, <laughs> if I'm looking at Netflix. But the problem is it would have stopped out, so it doesn't matter, right? Point is, is follow your plan. So we're gonna kind of end this with this, guys. You guys saw this last week. Take a picture of it again this week. Rehash it, because I'm not gonna go through it. Do not allow your obsessive need to be right to cloud your vision. Read the chart bar by bar read the chart always read it okay it will help you get in front of the next move it will help you discern the next move you guys ignore these powerful signals to stay in and get out if it's climactic it's a powerful signal to get out if something like we talked about earlier with that uh, buy setup and you saw like 10 one minute green bars and then you saw a red bar on the five it doesn't mean it's weak it means it's resting stay in it okay so it forces traders to confront what's actually happening in real time. It helps you become more objective. I hope that's what you took from this. And I also hope you also took real briefly from this last slide that your plan is always right. It's unfortunate that one penny cost me $1,400 today, but that's the way it is. It's simpler to follow your plan, guys. I said it to you last week and last month. I was slightly behind my plan but I took the twistiest, curviest, windiest mountain road where the plan took the, the road straight to the top of the mountain. I curved around the whole mountain to finish behind my plan last month. Why? All I have to do is get into a trade and set my bracket order and start scanning for the next idea. But no, 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 not me. I got to sell a quarter at 1R, then a third at 1R, then raise the stop and then wait for it. No, just follow your plan. It's simpler and it will usually end up making more money anyway right it's simpler and we'll usually end up making more money anyway all right so i hope that you guys learned a bit about how to get more granular in your trades right not only will it help you stay out of some trades because they're already extended you wouldn't have known that had you not drilled down right you look at a five minute bar it's up two bars in a row and all of a sudden you're like i'm going to take that trade it's a five minute three bar play and then you realize it's actually up 10 bars on a one minute, probably not the best trigger entry that you want. So it'll help keep you out of that. Those pre-market charts will help keep you out of a new move off the open at 930 because it's already extended for the last 20 minutes. I also hope that you learn that your plan is always right. Even when you have a very bad day, your plan is still right because it will give you the good days to make up for those bad days. Follow it. It's the simplest approach to profits in this business. All right. So I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We'll get back at it again next week.